welcome to this week's episode of Under the Influence, where I sit down with different content creators to discuss their process, their story, and any challenges they face in this era of social media content creation. My guest this week is Tori of the Oz Vlog. Tori creates content for TikTok, as well as several other platforms. She also carries the title of Oz Historian, making her part of a very exclusive club. I sat down with Tori on TikTok Live to chat about her story and the story of Oz. I'm a Wizard of Oz historian and collector, as you can see. I've been a fan of the Wizard of Oz my whole life. I saw it for the first time, allegedly, when I was two years old and I've just never stopped loving it. I'm originally from New York and I'm um, just living my best life doing this. You know, I've been making content about The Wizard of Oz now for over 15 years. I started on YouTube and um, somebody, this is actually gonna be funny, but um, when they were originally talking about banning TikTok back in the day as an act of rebellion, I downloaded it. And um, I just start. it's the only thing I know how to do. So I just started posting about Oz stuff and people liked talking about it. So it's just great to be here and to have a community of people who also love Oz and people who are interested in learning about the history and the lore. And it's just a great opportunity to connect. 15 years. So in this current climate, what's your principal format? Right now, TikTok's my principal format, TikTok and the photo app, Instagram. And I do still post on YouTube, but mostly for my patrons, because we have a little Patreon community, and I post some long-form content there. Um, I would love to get back into doing it more, but we also host, my dear friend and fellow Oz historian Ryan Jay and I also host an Oz talk show called Oz Talk. It's like The View, but for Oz fans. And uh, we do that uh, mostly over on YouTube. So this is what you do full time? Pretty much. <laughs> I do have a day yeah. job also okay. because I love having expendable income so I can come visit the great state of Florida and go visit Disney every couple of years because nice <laughs> that's plug. a big tradition for us. We The whole family goes. Um, so I do, ha I hold down a day job as well. But yeah, this is pretty much full time at this point. Yeah, but that's, that's two jobs. That's what most people don't realize. It's not It's not a hobby to do this at the level that you do it it is it's an operation you know it's it's a full-time gig but it's stuff i would be doing anyway like i i was collecting and talking about oz and going to oz festivals and hosting these lives with my oz friends we started oz talk back in 2020 during the pandemic so it's been four years already and so you know this is stuff i'd be doing anyway so i love it i love it too so so take me back to, to first of all uh, what were you doing before you got into starting this Oz content? And when you first started, give me a little insight into sort of that jump off point for you. So what was I doing before my Oz content? So I was just privately collecting. And, you know, I really didn't realize at first how big of an Oz community there is out there. I've been a member of the International Wizard of Oz Club since I was nine years old, but I didn't realize, you know, that's a pretty small group of folks because it's a subscription service. They still do mail-in subscription type stuff. Um, and so I didn't realize the scope. And then right before I left for college, I posted a YouTube video because YouTube had just hit the airwaves. Google didn't own it yet. It was brand new. No one knew what to do with it. And I just posted something like quickly about like, this is my Oz collection. And I went off to college, totally forgot about it because I'd used my old email address, came home, opened it back up. And there were hundreds of messages from folks saying like, oh my God, I didn't realize there are other big Oz fanatics out there. I thought I was alone on this island. and. I started getting a lot of messages from um, young people who, you know, said that they were the only gay person that they knew in the Midwest and um, that Oz made them feel less alone. And it was so nice to connect with somebody else who felt the same way. And it was like, oh my gosh, you know, this has real value to people like, like it does to me. And that really just, um, it was shocking and in the best possible way. And it kind of just got out of control from there. <laughs> It's amazing what one little spark does. One little and, spark. and then, so where, where, where does being an Oz historian plug into that? 
So I've been studying the film and the history and the books all my life. Um, and then I met up with Ryan Jay, who's also an Oz historian, dubbed so by John Fricke, another fantastic Oz historian. And um, he and I started talking and hanging out together, becoming friends. And he's the first person that gave me that label. I was uncomfortable with it at first, you know, it felt like a very grandiose, ridiculous title. And he said, no, own it, embrace it. That's what you are. And um, when we started doing Oz Talk, I really embraced the title which of course means nothing. You don't have a degree in Oz history, but um, you know, it's a, it's actually a tip of the hat to L. Frank Baum, who was the original Royal Historian of Oz, and that title has passed down over time. So I'm just one of many. There are many right now doing stuff in the land of Oz, and there are so many up and coming Oz historians as well, young kids really into the lore, really knowledgeable. So there's a fresh crop of Oz historians right behind me, ready to take over the mantle, and it's so exciting. It's, that's such a perfect segue into my next question because you've been doing this for 15 years. You, you're, you're not the only person. No. So where do, you, where do you notice that you've tapped into this community, this thing that you do? Because most of your content is pre-produced. I would imagine, you know, you do your live thing when you do it, but people are there for you at a certain point. What was that realization where it wasn't just, oh my, oh my gosh, because then you have to find, I would imagine there's that, that vulnerability where you're like, people want to know more about me all of a sudden. And I thought I was here for Oz. <laughs> you know, that's, that's an interesting question because I, I tend not to think about it very often. Last time we went to Disney world, as a matter of fact, uh, we got stopped a lot of times. Folks were like, Oh my God. And I was, I, I didn't really clock it, but my family was really like, because they, they only have a fringe understanding of what TikTok is and what we do here. And so they were like, wait a minute. <laughs> Um, it's really humbling and amazing that people become invested in you as a person, as well as this thing that you bring to the community, because every TikToker brings something unique to the table. It's why it's such a great place to be. Um, but yeah, it's really, really awe-inspiring and humbling, and I cannot believe at all that people are interested <laughs> in anything beyond just the stuff that's behind me. Um, but people are lovely, and we've built a really positive and well-meaning community of fans. That's a, that's remarkable, and, and the the platform evolution as well. I mean, you you know, again, why why I wanted to do this is I I love process, and I love listening to other creators and their process. So you start out on one platform, and I and again, I'm I'm thinking of my my journey here too. And then you have to embrace the next platform, right? Whatever it is, Instagram, TikTok. I mean, do you not find yourself spread thin on any given day trying to stay above the fray on all of these platforms? Because there's always something new. Do you know, honestly, no. It's so fun. It doesn't feel a lot like work. Um, there are moments, I will say, when my grandmother was ill and I was traveling a lot back and forth to go and help take care of her. That was when, you know, I, I had to say, okay, this has to be, I just have to put this away for a second. And I was making less content, but certainly was still making it. And bless her heart, she had no idea what I was talking about. I tried to explain it to her. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, I don't actually feel like it's a burden at all. I It's just fun. And people are so enthusiastic, especially right now, we're in the middle of an Azasance, so, uh, which happens every decade or so. And um, it's it's really a great moment to be an Oz fan. Now, is that an official thing or is that just sort of like the cultural resurfacing of the film every so often? Yeah, every decade when there's a big anniversary, um, there's this like resurgence, it, the 89, 90s years, like from 1989, from the 50th anniversary, that that wave lasted to the mid 90s. We had so much stuff, so many, I, we had ice shows and stage shows and remakes and it was just great. Cartoon series, I mean, it was just an avalanche. And then it was quiet for a bit. And then, you know, we had Oz the Great and Powerful and Legends of Oz Dorothy's Return. And that was like a little small bump. Of course, Wicked the Musical when it came out in 2003. And now with the Wicked movie, I mean, it's just everywhere and it's, awesome. There's a deluge of merch, which is making me very happy. And it's just wonderful. And yeah, it's going to give the wonderful thing about that is people are going to find 
the original stories through Wicked. People who've never read them, never seen the movie, um, are gonna find it through the lens of Wicked. And it's really fun to ask people like what their original, and I'd love to know your answer to this. What was your first introduction to Oz? Because everyone has a different entrance point. I feel like the majority of us saw the movie first, but these kids today are gonna grow up with Wicked being the thing that introduced them to that world. And that's so exciting. Yeah, the Wicked thing is, and it's in my notes too, because the Wicked of it all is a whole other conversation. And, and But to respond to that, I, so I remember, I can't tell you the first introduction because I would have been very, very young because it was in my blood. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm obsessed with Wizard of Oz um, to the point that every time that they, they released it on TV with additional footage or they would intercut uh, interviews, before, I, I, we would just sit around the TV as a kid. Like that was the thing. So I remember seeing the extended sequences of the scarecrow bouncing off the fence you know, um, I remember hearing the stories of the Wicked Witch being pulled off the trap door during one of the takes, you know, and, and, and almost like suffocating in the smoke because I think there was a fire on the trap door. So I just remember all these little stories as a kid and watching how they made it and using the stocking and the polyfill to create the, the twister. And, you know, I was just fascinated by the world inside the warehouse. Ever since I was a little kid, so I don't know where it started, but it is there and it always has been. So I didn't know that there was like a niche. I really didn't until Leah was like, did you, you know the Oz block? I'm like, what? <laughs> you know? Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's cinematic history, uh, but not just in the story front, on the technical side, right? I mean, there's a lot of achievements accomplished in that movie. Yeah, they were inventing the wheel. These things were not things that they had long precedent, you know, on how to do it. Yeah, you know, I feel like today filmmakers have a bag of tricks a century old that they can dig into to come up with different techniques. And um, it, it, even as easy as pushing a button with CGI, but that is not the case in 1939. There was no CGI. There were no computers. They were doing everything organically in camera or, you know, very delicately frame by frame in post-production. It was a labor of love and a very expensive process. And they were literally inventing the wheel. Every single thing they did, they were coming up with on the spot. Shout out the two-way mirrors. <laughs> um, so, okay, I, I really want to go down uh, the road and, and no pun intended. But talk to me a little bit more about process for a minute. Do, do, you, do you have an internal logic set for what you do when it comes to content creation? You know, I, my focus most of the time is answering people's questions because I get so many great questions every day. And wow. I really want to educate. That's my goal ultimately is to teach people about Oz and inspire other people's passion for it because I would like to see it last another 124 years. Um, so that's mainly what I do is answer questions and, um, try to, uh, pick things that I haven't talked about for a while or new things. And I also really, you know, when there's new merch drop, everything stops. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I felt that I want to share so much because so many folks yeah. that have found us through me are now collecting themselves and are dying to know what's the newest thing. So, um, that's really exciting. We all love our merch. It's very dangerous. In many ways, you're like, I do all this for the merch. It's like, just before we were waiting for you, I'm opening up stuff, you know, and I'm like, what, what am I doing? Like, what is this? I'm just opening up toys. Like, this is what I like, you know, but we love it. And I mean, even with your ears, I love that crossover and everything. And there is a synergy there too, by the way. Um, let's, 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 let's jump into that for a minute with the great movie ride. Um, I believe, well, so obviously the movie ride is the Eisner era, but I have something in my notes here um, because, okay, I'm, I'm kind of, tan I'm, I'm tangenting now off of a couple of things here. So I want to talk to you about the great movie ride, okay, but I also want to talk to you about the return to Oz because that was the Eisner era as well, right? It was right as Eisner was coming in, which is why there was so much confusion in marketing. But you can't talk about Return to Oz without talking about the Rainbow Road to Oz. You gotta go back to the Walt era because that's really where it began. Because- School me. 
In the 1950s, the Walt Disney Corporation bought 11 out of the 14 titles, the rights to 11 out of the 14 Oz book titles. And the plan was to use the uh, Mickey Mouse Club kids to uh, the Mouseketeers to do a live action Oz story. And they pitched, they did a whole episode of the Mickey Mouse Club where they pitched the idea to Walt and he says, yes, we're gonna make this movie. And the plan was to go forward and do that. They were gonna do, and it ended up being shelved because Walt was not happy with the script and with the music. It wasn't quite where he wanted it. And instead they made Babes in Toyland, ironically with Ray Bulger. But there's actually, you can go and watch this episode where they pitched this whole idea. And I wish they had gone through with it because it would have been so cool. But then in the 1980s, they still had the rights to these books and they were about to expire. And so Walter Murch came in and said he wanted to do an Oz story. And they're like, well, guess what? We happen to have the rights to these titles. What can you do with this? And he wanted to do a literal adaptation of L. Frank Baum's books. He didn't want to do a sequel to the MGM musical. He wanted to adapt the books, which are quite dark in tone. There's um, quite the body count in the Oz books. So he interpreted that pretty literally, made a what, what in my opinion is one of the best adaptations of L. Frank Baum's work so far on film. But right as he was making this, the Eisner era was, was taking off and they wanted to market this to a broader audience, most of whom knew the 1939 film and nothing else. And so if you watch the commercials for Return to Oz from the contemporaneous commercials for it, it's very light and happy and they don't really focus on the darker elements. And if you only saw that, you would have no idea what you were walking into. So audiences were very confused and um, affronted by what they actually got, which was a very dark movie. And Eisner wanted to fire Walter Murch, the director. He did fire him, as a matter of fact. And uh, it was actually um, George Lucas who saved him because he was good friends with him. And he said to Eisner and the Disney folks, listen, if he can't deliver, if he can't do the movie, I'll finish it myself. So they brought Murch back on board and he actually sent, uh, George Lucas sent an actor dressed as Darth Vader to hand him a congratulatory note on set. Um, and he did end up finishing it and it flopped miserably. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. but it's a cult, it has achieved cult classic status now and Disney ignores it for reasons that I do not understand. But it's turning 40 next year and I really hope Disney comes through for a celebration of Return to Oz because it deserves it. But Walter Murch, I mean, of all the people, that's not a, isn't that, that was his directorial debut too, right? Directorial debut and his last. <laughs> yeah, right. No, First and last and people directed don't realize, film. You know, it's funny, you just touched on, on something else. George Lucas did that a couple times, protecting legacy filmmakers. He did that with Coppola. And, and so, yeah, there's been a couple instances where Lucas has, has saved filmmakers from the mouse. And then ironically sold Star Wars to them. Yeah. So much to unpack in there. I love that. So I started to go down that road about the great movie, right? And then I started thinking of Return to Oz and because I'm thinking, how could you have such greatness and such failure for the same property come out of the same leadership era? But what you just, you just answered that because it did predate Eisner coming in. And then they yeah, tried to save it in marketing. Eisner been, had Eisner been at the helm already when production began, uh, I think it would have been a very different movie. Um, but then again, it's so unique in the greater Oz multiverse. I don't regret its existence. As a matter of fact, I it's one of my favorites. And um, it was kind of just lightning in a bottle. And I know it was not a financial success, but it educated a lot of people about the Oz books. Again, bringing them back to the forefront, they talked a lot about the history and the books during interviews, and a lot of people learned about the books through that movie. So I can't I can't say I regret it. You know, it's definitely got a cult following. It scared me. We had a copy of the book on our shelf growing up, and just the, the character designs creeped me out as a kid. I can't even tell you if I've seen the entire movie. Like, really? you know, and well, then of course, there's the, this, give it a watch. well, at this age, maybe I can, I can, I can suck it up, but 
the the st- the inconsistencies in style for me as a kid even threw me because I'm like, oh, who, that's not the scarecrow, you know? The poor scarecrow. Like that jumbo scarecrow. I feel so bad for the scarecrow. My favorite character, by the way, from every adaptation of Oz. And they they brought in Jim Henson's company to do the puppetry. And they had stop motion animation elements in there as well. But the puppetry was beautiful. And the scarecrow was meant to have a fully animated face, a fully animatronic face, like the Gump, like TikTok, like Bolina, like Jack Pumpkinhead. But when those um, initial fears of Eisner came into play, they pulled funding and they ran out of money and they couldn't do it. So it's a static face. And they just, they have like, worried face and happy face and they switch them off uh but it's it's uncanny valley <laughs> but you know those were the moves that eisner made throughout his tenure those those really swift decisions and they either worked or they flopped there was no middle and sometimes he pulled those moves and spent millions of dollars correcting them and they still worked so you know they, they said he was crazy but you know, from a Disney perspective, I think he was post Walt. I don't think he's, you had a better CEO. The company would be where it is today if it weren't for him. Now, ironically, almost every single property you just mentioned is now owned by Disney, Lucas, the Muppets. So, you know, here we are. Um, going back to Great Movie Ride. Great Movie Ride. So that that's an arms race to open up uh, Hollywood Studios. Well, MGM at the time was an arms race to beat Universal. Eisner came from Paramount. So many say that he had all of the information because Paramount had been approached for that. I don't remember if it was Seagram's or who it was, I'll let you correct me. But so anyway, so that's an arms race. So the licensing deal, talk to me how, about how that licensing deal and the great movie ride became the heart of that park. Because other than the movie tour, if it wasn't for the great movie ride, they would have had nothing. Yeah, I'm not really familiar with how they arranged the licensing. I know that they licensed those MGM properties were kind of laying dormant for a while. Um, they most of them are now owned by Warner Brothers, and I'm not sure how all of that went down. But the great movie ride talk about like this weird moment in history. The fact that all of this came together when you went on that ride. That whole park, my sister and I were talking about this earlier. It's very, now it's very disjointed and it feels like it's lacking in terms of connective tissue. But back in the day, that theming was strong. And that movie ride was the heartbeat of the whole place and really gave it its thesis. And that last scene with the Wizard of Oz was so iconic and so delightful. I just want to live in there. I miss that ride so much. And I totally understand that it either needed an upgrade or it needed to go and it was expensive to maintain those licenses. I get it, but I miss it very much. Well, I think there was also the, because MGM got acquired at some point there. There was a, there was a lot of strife going on with MGM too. And uh, so those Ruby slippers, I know there's a lot to, to unpack there. Were they stolen at some point? The Ruby Correct slippers that. that were in the Great From Movie the ride. ride. So yeah. the Ruby slippers that were in the Great Movie Ride were not always genuine slippers. Most of the time they were a replica pair. They did get a loan of a pair for a while. I don't remember which pair it was. They're about, we know of six pairs that exist. And one of them was in the Judy Garland Museum in Grand Rapids, Minnesota when they were stolen. They were missing for many years. They were stolen in 2018, I believe, and they just resurfaced last year. Um, and there are now two men indicted for the one man who was already convicted and one man is awaiting trial for the theft. They claim they didn't know that they were val- that valuable. They just thought they, they thought they were made of real rubies, wanted to nick the jewels and then ditch the shoes. They, they claim they had no idea the cultural significance of these shoes. I don't buy it. Um, but yeah, most of the time, most of the time, the shoes that were on display at the great movie ride were a replica pair and they were actually recently auctioned and they are now in the Wizard of Oz Museum in Cape Canaveral, Florida. Doesn't even make sense. Why would you, we just stole them. We didn't know what they were. They were just, we just like shoes. That makes no sense. Um, 
Wow. Okay. That's interesting. That's interesting. You know, people look at something like that and they don't see, they, they say they don't see the value. This movie is a piece of our history and it's, it's not just, I, and this is, this is, goes back to a larger Disney conversation I find myself having lately. These are, um, whether it's the parks, the movies, whatever we're talking about, some of these pieces of media, if you will, um, truly are art. Uh, and whether it, you can call it a movie, you want to call it cinema, whatever phrase you want to use, uh, it, it's, it's so significant to our culture and to our history. And the influence that a movie like The Wizard of Oz had, not just on the immediate generations, but like you said, with the wicked of it all to this day. I mean, Wicked is one of the most successful Broadway musicals of all time. And I would you wager know. it's going to be the most successful movie musical of a generation. That would be two my parter. Guess. That tells you everything you need to know. If you're making a two parter, you're cashing in. You know, and that was a decision that had a lot of people feeling very cynical, like, oh, this is such a cash grab. But I really think it was a genius move by John Shu and Universal um, because they wanted to really adapt the musical as thoroughly as possible. But how do you do that in a two hour span without cutting major plot points or, or big songs that people like? A lot of adaptations of movie musicals, if you notice, will cut the chorus numbers because they take up a lot of time and space. Uh, with these two parts, they will have room for all of it, and they'll be able to bring in elements from the books, both Gregory Maguire's Wicked novels and L. Frank Baum's books. So I'm really excited to see what they do with it. What is the origin of Wicked? I don't even know. I mean, I've seen Wicked. I've seen it on Broadway. It's a phenomenal show. I love it. But And I know Universal's behind the, this production, not Warner. But what is the actual, like, developmental origin story of the property as far as getting it to stage they there was a novel in the 90s called wicked the life and times of the wicked witch of the west it's by gregory mcguire he was the first author really to start this trend of looking at stories from the villain's point of view maleficent not the first it was wicked and it's a very adult dark um sexual book not for children, and but but it does pull themes from the 1939 film because of course the witch in the book is not green, but he brought that element into his book, and they Universal bought the rights to make a movie adaptation of Wicked, and Mark Platt, the Broadway producer, kind of went, this needs to be a musical. This has all the makings of a great musical. He brought in Winnie Holtzman to write the book and Stephen Schwartz to write the music. And by golly, it works. They, of course, they, they, they turned it into a family-friendly musical. And the elements from the books that are the strongest are the political allegory, the, the story of, you know, the effects of propaganda and of manipulation. And the wizard just blatantly says the thesis, you know, history is what everyone believes in. <laughs> um, so it's, but it was unique. It's, it was a unicorn at the time because women's stories on Broadway were unique, but now you have a story that centers around the friendship of two women. That was not a thing that was done at the time in the way it is now. And it was groundbreaking, just, incredible and it's timeless i go back and see it all the time if now i'm my next time will be number 20 and um it's it's just as fresh now as it was the first time i saw it did you, did you see it with kristen chenoweth i wish no i missed kristen chenoweth and adina menzel i saw them for the first time in 2006. um my oh. first alphabet was shoshana bean and my first glinda was megan hilty and they were phenomenal phenomenal so you're doing a fantastic job of teeing me up for my questions and i'm not saying that because <laughs> my next question is about glinda and uh so this actually leah who her mom watches you too said you've got to ask this and maybe you've been asked this a hundred times and if you have please tell us okay because i'm sure you get asked these questions all day long i could answer why them. She... <laughs> let's go why yeah. is she not represented in Oz? Why is Glinda not represented in Oz? 
I, why do we not? I, I'm sorry. Why does she not? Why is there no? I'm sorry. I have I'm crossed two questions in my head. Why is she not represented in Kansas? Ah, okay. So for the 1989 film, point. and this was not for this was not in the book. This was an idea that was originated for the 1939 film. This idea that there are these Kansas counterparts to the folks she meets in Can in Oz. So they did that, the filmmakers did that to ground the film in realism because they didn't think a 1939 audience would buy a fantasy film. And they wanted to give the big stars, you know, Ray Bulger, Burt Lahr, Jack Haley, time without their makeup on to be seen before going into Oz and being covered in layers of makeup. Believe it or not, Judy Garland was not a household name at the time, but Ray Bolger, Burt Lahr, and Jack Haley were huge vaudeville stars who made their break in Broadway and then went to film and everyone knew who they were. So they wanted to give them more face time. So there are, there are a lot of theories about why Glinda is not represented in Kansas, but my favorite is that Glinda represents the maternal figure in Dorothy's life, Dorothy's mother, who of course is gone and um, she's an orphan and she's living with her aunt and uncle. And so the reason we don't see her in Kansas is because she's no longer a part of Dorothy's life in Kansas, but in her fantasy world, in her imagination over the rainbow, there is this effervescent maternal character who floats down in her bubble to give her just enough information to get on the yellow brick road, but. She doesn't hand her all the answers and she doesn't feed her all the information she needs. She lets her make her own mistakes and walk her own path and find her own found family and lets her get to the other side of that journey without interfering too much. I'm still hung up on basically the audience wasn't sophisticated enough for fantasy. You know, it just hadn't been done on this scale. The only, right. reason, the only reason they felt confident even going this far was because Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs had been such a hit. And they said, because before that, historically, fantasy films did not do well. Audiences didn't engage with it. So they were like, if we're going to make a big budget movie musical fantasy film, we had better ground it in a way that our audience can relate to. Because don't forget, this was post-depression, pre-World War II. So right. this was an audience of folks who had been through some stuff. <laughs> sure. Um, and, um, but it turns out that escapism was something that Americans were craving in a really big way. Well, and then rooting in, a re in reality that makes that escapism more relatable in turn, right? So the second part of that was M and Henry. And I think there's enough ambiguity where you can read it as Oz being real. I think there is just enough ambiguity where you can say and and pretty much every sequel ever done every canonical sequel ever done has retconned the ending and said oz is real so because uh, dorothy always ends up going back <laughs> even as recently as tom and jerry back to oz which is technically canon because warner brothers made it um what happens she sits up in bed pulls up the covers and the ruby slippers are on her feet tom tom and jerry tom and jerry yeah like the cat and mouse, they made a cartoon called Tom and Jerry and the Wizard of Oz, which was just a cartoon version of the Wizard of Oz with Tom and Jerry thrown into it. And then they made a sequel, which was unironically one of the best sequels I've ever seen to the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> they used deleted scenes from the 1939 film. They threw the jitterbug back in and it's oh my God. It's jitterbug. amazing. I'm going to need some links, please. I'm going to need some links. Um, okay, but so, so the cross wires there was that Henry don't really have any Oz presence, but I think you kind of answered that then. They didn't need to solve that problem. They didn't need to solve that problem. And if in some stage adaptations, they are included in Oz. They make Annie M. Sometimes the same actress who plays Annie M will play Glinda on stage. And sometimes the person who plays Uncle Henry will play the guardian of the gate in Emerald City. Um, not always, but sometimes which I think is an interesting choice. I prefer when Annie M and Glinda are separate people because that that serves my own headcanon. <laughs> I, I can't keep up with all, like I don't know what version's what anymore. I have so many um, disconnected memories. You just mentioned the jitterbugs and I think of the poppies and the jitterbug and I don't know what's what. So they obviously have so many alls. 
I mean, there was so much footage on the cutting room floor of that film. Unfortunately, uh, yeah. you know, they, they had, there were, if you notice, if you watch it now, it stops being a musical halfway through the musical. If I Were King of the Forest is the last song in the movie, which, isn't that crazy? Like, and half the movie's not a musical. And you could say, oh, well, it shifts to a darker tone, and that's why. But the truth is, they had several songs queued up after that. There was going to be uh, The Jitterbug, then a reprise of Over the Rainbow, and then a, a reprise of Ding Dong, The Witch is Dead, where they march back to Emerald City. So... They cut all of that for time. They wanted to really get to that climax quickly. So, but it's such a shame because those were wonderful. <laughs> but you can still hear the tracks. The, the audio still exists. And on these deluxe versions of the soundtrack, you can still hear them. Uh, I'm telling you, uh, thank you so much for doing this because I, I feel like we should do this again in like a couple months or something yeah. because I'm going to have more questions. We're just scratching the surface. I, I have one final question. This has been amazing. Uh, I love the insight to your process. I know I'm going to end this with you and be like, I should have asked her that. And when you get a message from me, you'd be like, why is he asking me? The interview's <laughs> over because I really want to know these things. I, I just have questions, you know, and I'm always learning from others. So this is this is our, our, our final question of the interview. This has been fantastic. And I'm going to ask you this. Once you're done answering it, please plug your platforms and, and drop everything Surrender Dorothy. Is that addressed to Dorothy or to Oz? You know, it can be read either way. And it's an abbreviated version of what was originally going to be written in the sky. The original writing in the sky was Surrender Dorothy or Die, WWW, Wicked Witch of the West. They cut the or die part because they thought it was too scary for children, too severe. But it could be read either way. It's And in some stage versions, the witch actually goes to the Emerald City and demands that the citizens of the Emerald City surrender her. And they refuse. And um, she leaves that message. But um, I think you could read it either way. Either like, hey, you, surrender, or you folks, surrender her to me. So, you know, just the witch terrorizing the citizens, per usual. Tori's commitment to informing her audience and answering their questions speaks volumes to the power of content creation as a tool for education. Join us next time for another episode of Under the Influence.